Welcome to lecture 17. And this lecture talks about state dependent preferences, projection, and attribution of bias. The plan for today is to talk about preference changes. So we're going to look at different circumstances in which people's preferences predictably uh, and sometimes unpredictably change over time. That is to say, sometimes people are hungry, tired, or in pain, and their preferences for certain outcomes may be determined by that underlying state of like hunger, for example. Now, it's pretty clear that people's preferences change according to those states, as in like when somebody is hungry, they want different things, they want to eat different kinds of things than when they're not hungry, um, and so on. Um, but people nevertheless have trouble predicting their preference changes. That is to say, if somebody is hungry, they may have a hard time predicting how it feels when they're not hungry and vice versa. So uh, notice that this lecture is a sort of a continuation, a natural continuation of our lectures on beliefs um, uh, from before. So before we looked at people trying to learn about um, unknown information around them and we looked at various deviations why people are not able to learn. Now we're going to look at people trying to learn or um, failing to learn at times uh, about their own preferences. Uh, and an important particular case here is um, what's called production bias, which is people's um, lack or for um, inadequate ability to predict their own preferences, in particular for different states of the world in the future. I'm going to be more specific about that. But mostly we're going to talk about projection bias in the paper by Lowenstein et al., which is in the readings. We can talk very um, briefly about attribution bias um, that's going to be covered in recitation. Okay. So, although not typically emphasized in economics, a simple and obvious fact is that our preferences um, change over time. There's various ways in which um, uh, our preferences change. One is short-term temporary fluctuations, um, and you can call them sort of state-dependent preferences. You can call all of what we're going to talk about state-dependent preferences. Um, um, here is uh, the state is like a short run physiological or psychological state, for example, hunger, um, uh, pain, or the like, or uh, a psychological state such as mood. Um, we're going to talk about all of these in more detail. Second, there are long-run systematic changes. Um, this could be due to own uh, uh, choices, such as addiction. So like if somebody has been drinking alcohol for the last 10 years, their utility from drinking alcohol or not drinking alcohol is quite different from somebody who has not been drinking um, ever. Same is true for smoking um, and the like. Um, or it could be independent of one's choices, for example, aging. So predictably, people's preferences change over time when they're 20 year, years old versus when they're 80 years old. Uh, notice that for addiction, there's also some short-run um, temporary fluctuation, such as when people have just smoked a cigarette versus not, their preferences for an additional cigarette might be quite different. But then there's also long-run systematic changes, which is like uh, if somebody has been smoking a lot during the last you know, 10 years versus not. So there's smoking or addiction in particular as both short-term and long-term uh, temporary and systematic um, um, changes in people's preferences. And then there's adaptation to changes, which happens often for big changes uh, such as standard of living or small changes such as smug ownership. What's an example here, for example, if people win the lottery, they become happier. Um, they become actually a lot happier um, very quickly, but then that sort of reverts um, uh, back to like the their, their previous standard over time. People, lottery winners, even like a few years later, clearly are happier than people who have not won the lottery, but their uh, increase in happiness uh, decreases um, over time. Okay, so, so these are three different types of sets of preference changes. We're going to mostly focus in the lecture today on number one, short-term temporary um, reflectors. Now, what, I'm gonna, what, what am I talking about here? So one um, uh, example here is hunger. Now, studying hunger is difficult uh, in experiments because uh, uh, it's unethical to starve uh, people. Now, you could, of course, find hungry people and give them food. That's, in some sense, what uh, was done once in what's called in the Minnesota starvation experiment. This is an experiment that was motivated by the fact that there was lots of soldiers in the Second World War in the U.S. and Europe, uh, from the U.S. and Europe and in many other uh, uh, places. 
And these soldiers had been starved from the war for a long time. And they came back from the war to back to the US. And one simple question was, as well, when you, when you have people who have been starved, um, um, have not eaten um, for a long time or very little for a long time, how do you best reintegrate them into um, uh, society? Or like, how do you best sort of feed them? Do you feed them very quickly, like a lot, or do you sort of gradually increase their food take over time? So then the army did some experiments with healthy volunteers, such as this guy here on the left. And uh, in, uh, people were starved, uh, literally starved, by uh, getting very little food um, for a while, such that you know, after a few weeks, the guy would look like this. Um, and then the army would look at people's uh, behavior over time. They were mostly interested in, like, once you have somebody who has not eaten for quite a while, once you give them more feed, food, what's happening to their um, behavior, and what's uh, you know, the best way of, of doing that. Um, coincidentally, they also recorded what ha what's happening in the first part of the experiment when people were starved to start with. And so, you know, as expected, people get extremely focused on food when they don't eat for a while. They really get really, really interested in learning about what's going on with food and, and, and when they get next food and so on. But as it happens, it seems to be that their preferences also change um, in various other ways. In particular, I see people seem to lose interest in lots of other activities. There's reported uh, uh, decreased alertness, lack of self-control, general apathy. People are just sort of like almost like a different person when they are almost starved compared to like when they have eaten um, a lot. Um, here are some testimonies from, from these soldiers. Uh, one of them is the acquisition of food-related items was a reasonable extension of their heightened interest in food. So as we expect, people get really interested in food. Much less reasonable was the buying of old books, unnecessary secondhand clothes, knickknacks, and other junk. Often after making such purchases, which uh, could be only uh, afforded only with sacrifice, the men would be puzzled as to uh, why they had bought such uh, more or less useless articles. So that's essentially sort of saying that people got really interested in certain purchases. Their preferences towards those kinds of purchases seems to have changed. There seems to have also some preference reversal. They seem to want to buy certain things and then wonder afterwards, afterwards why they did so, um, which all seems to be the consequence of being really, really hungry. Um, then came the day when I lost my will to activity. I no longer cared to do anything that required energy and days began to drag. It seems to be in some ways like a, like a direct effect of like having a low caloric intake, but really um, uh, people's preferences towards physical or any other activity uh, seems to have changed quite a bit due to hunger. Um, and, and another one here is, uh, there's nothing that can uh, hold my interest for long, I wait for meal time. So this is your, your people's attention seems to really be uh, uh, lowered quite a bit and to the extent that we think attention affects people's preferences and decision making in various ways. Again, hunger seems to have this effect on people's um, choices. Now, what's a more sort of like real world example for, for you guys? Well, that's shopping on an empty stomach. There's sort of a classic study by Nisbet and Canoes from 1969, but there's sort of other evidence um, uh, later. And the folk wisdom is that shopping on an empty stomach leads people to buy more and perhaps also um, uh, more junk food. Um, now, how do you study this? Well, you can think about different ways in which you might do that. You could sort of induce people directly to eat when they're hungry versus not. Um, you know, uh, uh, and there's various other ways in which you could think about like setting up experiments. Now, one very simple ways in which one um, uh, uh, can study this issue is by just randomly giving um, a sample of individuals entering a supermarket a candy bar. It could be a candy bar, it could be also some power bars or some other food. And so now essentially what you do then is you take a bunch of people who go shopping and uh, uh, they might be, some of them might be hungry and some might not be. But then the ones that are hungry in particular, when they eat like a candy bar or any other food, um, they might they become less hungry. And so then we have a treatment condition that's less hungry and a control condition who's not getting any uh, food who is like more hungry. And so then um, uh, that allows essentially to look at like um, um, uh, var variation in like whether people are currently hungry um, while shopping. Another thing one could do is one could vary the timing of the last meal before shopping. There you worry a little bit like if that's not experimentally induced that the people who like go uh, shopping right after having a meal versus not might be quite different in various other ways.
but you could in principle also like experimentally induce that. And then, you know, you can look at like monitor how, how, how much and what kinds of food people buy. So hungry people tend to buy more, so they, they just simply buy more food. They also more tellingly buy more junk food. So their preferences really seem to be uh, different. To be clear, people tend to buy more, not just sort of like say, I'm gonna buy like now um, a power bar of the lake, for example, a banana because I'm really hungry, I'm gonna buy it right after I leave the store, but they buy significantly more, more than can be explained by just filling your immediate hunger. And in particular, they also seem to change the type of food that they buy, in particular, in this case here, more um, junk food. Here's kind of what this then looks like. The left guy is uh, full. He eats, he you know, buys lots of lettuce, diet water, and so on. The guy on the right um, um, is hungry. He buys all sorts of things, um, a lot more, as you can see, um, and a lot of also like unhealthy food, including tortilla chips, cheese, sugar water, um, um, and so on. Uh, so, you know, next time you go shopping, you should sort of introspect and see what your preferences towards what you buy have been affected. Now, another thing you can think about is, is uh, uh, that affects your preferences is underlying state is your sleep. When you're tired, the whole world seems different in various ways. Um, you know, one example you can think about is like um, self-control. Sleep deprivation is associated with lack of self-control. Um, there's sort of this literature, old literature that says self-control is a muscle that replenishes overnight. There's some issues with this, um, uh, with this literature. Uh, there's some uh, experiments that might not necessarily um, uh, replicate. Uh, 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 but the idea that um, lack of self-control um, uh, might be a consequence of lack of sleep uh, seems very plausible um, um, uh, in, in various ways. Uh, uh, notice that there goes to also be causality in the other direction. Lack of self-control may also be a cause of poor sleep. Now, uh, there's some evidence that sleep affects uh, people's preferences. Um, when people are sleep deprived, um, uh, they tend to, to gain weight. Uh, tired people engage more in what's called cyber loafing, they surf more on the internet. Um, there's also some evidence that sleep might, or lack of sleep might affect ethical behavior. People cheat more on, when they're tired. Um, and we have some evidence in our experiment in India which I'm going to show you in a little bit uh, uh, at the end of the semester, that naps increase savings and seem to reduce people's um, um, present bias. So really, uh, this is a, some evidence of sleep affecting people's time preferences. Uh, another uh, example is badger et al. and, and addiction. Um, this is a very small study with only like 13 subjects. So you, know, you might sort of take all of what's in there with a little bit of grain of, 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 of salt. Um, but, you know, I think the, the underlying uh, message and the findings are, are correct. So what did Badger et al. do? They elicited people's willingness to pay for a second dose of the heroin substitute BOP. These are heroin addicts that are recovering and they tend to have um, uh, often cravings and BOP essentially helps people um, not to relapse and not to take heroin again. And so they get at regular intervals, they get um, BOP doses. Now, uh, it would be sort of unethical to withhold people um, uh, these doses, but what, what the experiment is doing, and it's still sort of ethically, ethically perhaps tricky, but what they were asking for is people's willingness to pay for a second dose of heroin, uh, of the of BOP, the heroin substitute. So all individuals in the experiments regularly, regularly receive their single dose of BOP. And, um, and then uh, there's also like uh, an additional dose they could get, and then there was some variation in the experiment. What was the variation? There was variation in the state of deprivation. So um, people were either asking all the questions about our willingness to pay for a second dose of BOP, right? Everybody always got the first dose, but then uh, there was some uh, variation in timing. For some people, um, uh, this is the more deprived condition, People were asked about their willingness to pay for a second dose two hours before the scheduled first dose. And the less deprived people were asked like right after the scheduled first dose. So again, everybody's getting a first dose and we're asking about willingness to pay for a second dose always. Some people are asked about this two hours before the scheduled first dose when they're really sort of deprived and craving when they really want their first dose. And uh, others are asked when they're less deprived right after the scheduled first dose. Notice that the second dose is always held constant. So everybody always gets the first dose and the second dose is held constant in the future, at least in those kinds of questions. So really the willingness to pay should not depend on your current state. 
right? In the future, you're going to get a second dose, which is once you have already gotten the first dose. So like whether you uh, I ask you like two hours before or right after you schedule those should will have no effect on your willingness to pay in the future because that's gonna that, that experience is held um, fixed and you always get the first of those. Now they also asked uh, varied in addition um, the timing of a potential second dose. Uh, so sometimes the second dose was later on the same day and sometimes the second dose was during the next week. Now, what do Badger, Badger et al. find? They find that people's willingness to pay varies systematically with the state and the delay. What's the state here? The state is the state of deprivation, whether people are more deprived or less deprived. And then the timing is essentially either about today versus um, uh, next week. Now, the median willingness to pay for the second dose later today is $50 in the satiated state and $75 in the deprived state. And we're going to um, get back to this, how we think about this, how we can explain this. But basically, the way we explain this is that in the deprived state, people's willingness to pay um, um, is higher um, because they really, really want like first dose. So people's willingness to pay for the first dose is high in the deprived state. And it's lower in the satiated state because they already have the, or the, sorry, people's willingness to pay for any additional dose um, is high in the deprived state because they haven't even gotten the first dose, and it's lower um, in the satiated state. But what people seem to be doing now, they seem to have like a hard time imagining their utility in the future. That is to say, in the future, both people will be satiated. So what's happening here is that people, when people are in the deprived state, they really, really want PUP, and they're willing to pay more um, um, uh, than when in, in the satiated state, again, for the second dose of the future. Now, there's also some evidence of willingness to pay for the second dose next week. And again, people's willingness to pay, and so the previous one was later today, uh, now it's for the next week. People's willingness to pay in the deprived state is uh, sixty dollars in the satiated state. It's thirty-five dollars. So um, again, people's willingness to pay is higher in the deprived state. That is to say, when in the deprived state, really, 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 people want BOP, and they cannot really imagine that in the next week, um, uh, people's uh, when they're satiated, they they will actually want BOP um, less. To be clear in both the um, uh, uh, the first when the late dose is later today and when the dose is next week uh, it'll always be the case that people have already um, received the first day dose and then the question is always about what's your willingness to pay to receive a second dose so when they're in the future they will always be satiated um, but people in the deprived state seem to be reacting or seem to be behaving as if in the future they would also be in the deprived state but of course, people will be in the satiated state, so people seem to overestimate uh, when they're in the deprived state how much they um, um, would like the second dose in the satiated state in the future. Now, here's another example by Schelling. And Schelling is a beautiful um, a writer um, in economics. He's one of the best um, writers that economics has. Granted, uh, there's lots of bad writing in economics, um, but if you want to write some read some beautiful um, uh, writing um, uh, by an economist, um, Schelling has a bunch of different um, books um, that are really um, nice to read and, and, and essays that are really beautiful. Now, in his paper in 1984, um, he talks uh, briefly about a controversial question, which is the use of anesthesia during childbirth. And uh, why is that controversial? Well, anesthesia is um, reducing um, uh, the mother's uh, pain during, uh, during childbirth, but there's the potential for some side effects there's also the potential that people's uh, experience is, is different. And um, um, for both of those reasons, some people argue that um, uh, uh, anesthesia is not warranted and, and, and um, uh, decide not to do that. Now, in many cases, people's preferences change predictably over time. First, ex ante, before um, the woman gives birth, uh, many women prefer not to use anesthesia. Once they are in excruciating pain, they request, they request anesthesia from their doctor. And then if they actually get the anesthesia from the doctor exposed after um, uh, uh, the child is born, they regret their choice. They say, I wish I hadn't gotten anesthesia. Now, that 
pattern holds even for women who have given birth before. And it causes or it leads to a bunch of ethical dilemmas and legal issues. For example, to which patient is a physician obligated? The one asking for anesthesia or the one who asks that, that it be withheld, right? The person told the doctor, like, I really, really do not want any, any anesthesia. Even if I ask you later, please do not give me anesthesia. But then, of course, the person then yells at the doctor and says, I really, really want anesthesia. Give me anesthesia right now. And so there's essentially different, uh, there's preference reversals. People seem to want different things at different points in time. And uh, the doctor you know, you know, can only make one of these two people happy. And so no matter what the doctor does, either if the person gets and gives the person anesthesia, then uh, person number two in my list here above is going to be happy, but person number one and person number three are unhappy or the person withholds anesthesia and then person number two is unhappy. So either way, the doctor cannot satisfy uh, uh, these different selves um, over time. Now, can the physician enter a contract with the patient ex ante before? Is it, is it possible to have a legally binding contract here where he says like, you know, um, uh, he or she says, I'm not gonna give any anesthesia, and you told me so. Um, do we want policies that such contracts, uh, make such contracts possible? Is that, an, uh, is that a desirable thing to do? Is it a legally required thing to do? Uh, potentially impossible to, to require this legally, I'm not sure. But the point here really is that um, there is um, uh, uh, some misprediction going on here, right? Ex ante, the, the person says, well, if I'm in pain, I will be fine. I'm not going to need anesthesia. But then, of course, when the person is actually in pain, the person wants anesthesia. So essentially, people seem to mispredict their preferences when they're in pain, and that leads to all sorts of trouble here. I really recommend you read the, the paper by Schelling that's on the course website if you want to sort of uh, think about this a little bit more. Now, so far, um, we talked about that preferences change predictably due to changes in underlying states. Now, what are those, those states? It could be like pain, hunger, sleep, and so on. Now, um, there's additional status factors that people make systematic mistakes at predicting preference changes, right? So people, not only is it that your preferences are different when you're tired versus not, but people are also systematically mispredicting that preference change. Now, what is production, production bias, to be clear? It's the fact that people underappreciate changes in their preferences, projecting their current preferences onto future preferences. So production bias, to be clear, is not just some random misprediction, but a misprediction with a systematic direction. Um, so people seem to understand the direction of preference change, but not the magnitude. That is to say, when people are hungry and think about like uh, how it's going to feel when they're not hungry anymore, they kind of understand that eventually they will not be hungry and that maybe, you know, suppose you're really hungry and really want potato chips, you sort of understand that you don't really want that many potato chips um, when you're full. Nevertheless, when people are hungry, they buy like 10 bags of potato chips as if they were like hungry at least for like half of their life, even though they're just, you know, they're going to be hungry for the next hour or two because then they're going to go home and go eat um, uh, uh, and so on. So people seem to um, understand the direction of people's preference hints, but not the magnitude. Now, um, the underappreciation of um, uh, the effects of hunger and preferences is, you know, perhaps not the most uh, economically important um, uh, you know, part of, of um, uh, production bias or the most important application, but there's two reasons to consider this evidence. Well, one, it's perhaps the clearest evidence of production bias. Second, people had lots of experience with changes in the levels of hunger, so any misprediction isn't due to the lack of opportunity to learn. Really, one should have probably learned uh, uh, this over time. For some other instances where, you know, um, this is only, for example, if you have lots of physical pain or for childbirth, for example, you might say, well, um, uh, you know, that seems to be like a, a sometimes even one in a lifetime experience where like people really, um, it's sort of understandable that people mispredict uh, uh, their preferences when they, be an when they are in excruciating pain. Um, but that's sort of understandable because you haven't experienced it before. And even, you know, for somebody, uh, a mother who has given uh, birth to a child before, um, that mother might sort of just not misremember uh, to some degree. But when it comes to hunger, people have been hungry so many times and full and so on. So like really, you, you had lots and lots of opportunities to learn 
what your preferences are when you're hungry um, versus not. So really, it shouldn't be about a lack of opportunity um, to learn. Now, people buy more on an empty stomach. That can be interpreted as a manifestation of production bias. Hungry people act as if their future taste for food um, will reflect their current hunger, at least to some um, uh, degree, or more so than it actually does. But it's not completely clean evidence of production bias because there could be always other things going on. For example, if you're really hungry, um, you might focus, uh, some things might be more salient to you and you know, there you might sort of buy certain things more because um, you pay more attention, for example, to potato chips and really sort of learn how uh, exciting potato chips are and so on. But um, let's just go with hunger um, uh, for now. There's lots of other evidence of production bias um, in addition to, to the hunger example. Now, remember the paper um, that we discussed on food choices by Reed and Van Leuven. This is the paper where office workers are asked to choose between a healthy snack and an unhealthy snack. Now, so far, we have looked at um, uh, this as a piece of evidence for um, present bias. We were looking at when people are choos choosing for the present right now versus when they choose for the future. Um, do people uh, make more uh, uh, unhealthy choices when they choose for the present? That is to say, the stylized fact that we found was that when people are choosing snacks for the future, they were um, quite likely to choose healthy snacks. So, you know, you choose salad for the future um, as your um, uh, snack in the afternoon. And when then in the, you ask again, like right now or today, what would you like? People seem, seem to switch their preferences towards unhealthy snacks that rather have like um, chocolates. And so we interpreted that at the time as evidence of present bias. And surely it seems like that is evidence of present bias. Now, in addition, now we're going to consider variation in the timing of those choices. So some people were asked when they were hungry late in the afternoon. Others were asked when they were satiated or arguably satiated immediately after lunch. And then the snacks were to be received in one week. So that's held constant, the timing. Otherwise, the timing is held constant. So we're always going to look at choices for snacks to be received in one week. Um, some of the, uh, in some of the cases, the snacks were uh, to be received when people were hungry or likely hungry late in the afternoon. In some other cases, um, the snacks were received when people were satiated immediately after lunch. Okay, so there's like four cases here. There's the timing of choice, either people ask whether they're hungry versus not, um, and then the timing of the receipt of the snack, which is when they were hungry versus not. And the question now is, are hungry people now good or bad at um, predicting their preferences when they're satiated, and are satiated people are good or bad when they're um, uh, predicting their preferences when they're hungry, sort of in the different um, state. Okay, so we're going to interpret here um, the, uh, so here's a table um, from Reed and Van Leuven, table number one. Uh, it's a bit of a sort of confusing table um, uh, for no good reason. Uh, let me just walk you very um, quickly through that table. So the rows are the current hunger and the columns are future hunger. So the first row is when people were asked when they were hungry. So this is like uh, late in the afternoon. The second row is people were asked when they were satiated, that's like um, right after lunch. And then the columns are, um, again, uh, remember all of the choices are for next week. So the first column is choices for when people were um, hungry, that's late in the afternoon. And the second column is when people were satiated, um, that's um, right after lunch. Remember again, all choices are for uh, next week, so or for one week in the future. Now. We can interpret now the main diagonal um, of this table as reflecting people's true preferences. That is to say, here's no projection bias here. People are asked when hungry about to predict what they wanted to, or to, to say what they wanted in the future when they were likely going to be uh, hungry as well. That is to say, 78% of people are um, choosing an unhealthy snack for the future um, uh, when they're hungry. So that's in the late afternoon for the future case when they're in the late afternoon. Uh, in contrast, only 26% of people choose um, uh, uh, the unhealthy snack when they're satiated, that is um, right after lunch, uh, for when the, um, uh, uh, the snack will be delivered in one week right after lunch. 
right? So there's here's no production bias here because essentially this underlying state hunger is held constant. Hungry people uh, predict them for when they're hungry or, or asking uh, what they want when they're hungry. 78% of people think they want unhealthy stuff. And um, uh, uh, again, satiated people, 26% of people say um, they want unhealthy stuff. So 74% of people say they want the healthy snack uh, in contrast when they're satiated, okay? So again, that's, that's what's written here. Late in the afternoon when people are hungry, 78% of people choose the unhealthy snack for the late afternoon when they will be hungry. Immediately after lunch when they're satiated, 26% of people choose the unhealthy snack for immediately after lunch when they will be, will be satiated. Now, then what we see here is um, uh, 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 the, the entries that are off the main diagonal, uh, those data fit the pattern of um, projection bias. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's look first that when people who are hungry but expect to be satiated. That is the, um, the, the first row here, current uh, hunger is hungry. That's essentially people are asked um, late in the afternoon or think about this as being likely hungry. And they ask about like when, uh, uh, what do they want when they are, um, uh, when they're satiated, that is like right after um, lunch. Now remember, um, when people were satiated, 26% of people said they wanted an unhealthy snack. Now, when people are hungry, 42% of people say they want an unhealthy snack, so that fraction is higher. So that is very much consistent with projection bias. The reason being that when hungry, when people are hungry um, um, uh, and uh, say what they want for themselves um, in the hungry state, well, 78% of people say they want the unhealthy snack. If people did not have any projection bias, they really should be saying 26% if we sort of believe that satiated people know best what they want when they, be, when they will be satiated. Instead, 42%, a higher fraction of people say they want um, an unhealthy snack um, or, or while, when predicting or when, 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 when um, answering while they're hungry um, for when they will be satiated. So people seem to understand the direction in which their tastes change as they become satiated, but they underestimate the magnitude of this change. Similarly, people who are currently satiated but expect to be hungry underestimate um, the effect of hunger on their preferences for unhealthy snacks. Uh, remember, um, satiated people, sorry, um, hungry people, um, uh, when they when they want to uh, when they choose for uh, next week uh, when they will be hungry, seventy eight percent of people say um, they want the unhealthy snack. Now, in contrast, when they're satiated, fifty six percent of people choose the unhealthy snack. So again, that fraction now deviates from the fraction when people are are hungry. Um, which is again consistent with people understand the direction in which taste change as they become hungry, but they underestimate the magnitude of this change. So satiated people think that when they're in the future hungry, they will be behave um, um, at least a little bit like uh, as if they were satiated. And hungry people seem to think that uh, when they're satiated in the future, they will still behave as if they were hungry. Notice that, um, uh, that this misprediction is partial. So again, so, so both the 42% the um, is in between the, um, the 42% is in between the 26% uh, and the, um, let me see. The 42% is in between the 26% and the 78%. And again, the 56% is between the 26% and the 78%. So there's essentially some partial misprediction um, going on here. Now, uh, let me show you now a, a number of other examples of um, projection bias. And I'm gonna write down a, a little model that sort of captures um, this intuition or the intuition that's here. So uh, uh, one, another example is, uh, is catalog orders. This is Condon et al. Imagine um, there's a cold evening, it's really cold outside, maybe you are just outside and so on, and then you are online shopping. Notice that in Condon et al, really it's catalog orders and not um, online shopping because online shopping didn't quite exist uh, at the time. Uh, but any, in any case, you imagine you buy online a warm uh, jacket. Um, and again, it's like really cold right now. You really wish you had a uh, warm jacket. But then when the, the 
warm jacket arrives, it's 30 degrees warmer um, uh, when that happens. Now, um, that could or could not be, or potentially is a mistake. In particular, if it's an unusually um, cold um, a day, uh, if people have production bias, they might sort of think that, well, right now they really need like a warm jacket and they can't even imagine that they might not need this warm jacket anymore um, in a few days from uh, when it actually arrives from the order. And so the hypothesis is that production bias leads to an increase in purchases of cold water, weather items uh, on cold weather days. And not only that, but controlling for received day temperature, the likelihood of returning a cold weather uh, object is higher when the day of ordering was cold. So not only are buying, people are buying more cold weather items um, on cold weather days, that seems very reasonable because you know you might just say, I always wanted a jacket anyway, it's really cold and I, that just reminds me that I really need one. Or for example, it's really rainy and you buy an umbrella because again, you sort of just remembered that you really needed one or maybe if you got it somewhere and so on. But the telling part here is that the likelihood of returning the cold weather item uh, object is higher when the day of ordering um, was cold, right? And that's very much consistent with production bias. People um, uh, on cold weather days act as if um, the future were only full of cold weather days and therefore um, uh, their preferences um, uh, uh, would be such that uh, uh, they would always want cold weather items. Or put differently, people act as if um, uh, uh, their preferences for cold weather items, they really want a warm jacket, would not change even if in the future there will be warm days. Notice that in some of this evidence, what's um, hard to distinguish is the, uh, the, the predicting people's preference change in the future versus predicting future states. So um, if somebody predicted that it's going to be cold forever, you would act in the exact same way as if like, um, you predicted that your preferences are such that you always want warm jackets, you're always going to be cold. Now, production bias is about the latter. It's about people's preferences, but often it's actually hard to separate uh, predict, predictions of probabilities of how, how likely it is that it's going to be cold in the future from predictions of people's utility. Um, another example is car purchases on sunny versus um, uh, rainy or cold days. Imagine it's a nice sunny day and you go car shopping as you do it. Um, well, why and the, the car dealer offers your an, uh, Audi uh, a TT? Um, uh, you know why? I guess I never thought of the Audi TT. You go for a test drive and the wind whips through your hair. It's really sunny and great. And like having this, this car uh, uh, during the sunny day is really um, amazing. So, you know, you would love to, to buy a car like this. Um, why not? Imagine, in contrast, car purchases on an icy day. Imagine you're car shopping around the time of a freak snowstorm. You kind of wanted to have a car and somehow it's a snowstorm when you go um, car shopping. Now, the car dealer says, how about this Grant, uh, Jeep Grant um, uh, Cherokee? And you, you might say, why? why? I guess I never thought of the, the, the Jeep Grand Cherokee. Why not um, try it? You go for a test drive and you main traction on the black ice and you jump the curb with these. It's just amazing. Now, you might just say, well, I'm, I would love a car um, like this. Now, what people seem to then um, forgetting in both of these examples is that it might just happen to be a, a really uh, a bad uh, snow day on that particular day, or it might have just been like really sunny on that particular day and things might change um, over time and people might not um, understand that their preferences for um, uh, the Audi versus um, the Jeep might change um, with the weather um, over time. And that's exactly what Busse et al. are looking at. They're looking at how does weather impact uh, automobile purchases? Um, and um, in particular, what they look at is the weather on, or the prediction is that the weather, or the neoclassical prediction is that the weather on the day of a car purchase should have no influence on the type of car bought. So now what, what Busse and I'll look at is do idiosyncratic weather conditions, controlling for time of year, predict car sales, and then in particular also um, returns of those cars. And they look at two types of cars, in particular convertibles, and then they look at four-wheel drives like the Jeep that I just showed you. And the key part here is that they look at like idiosyncratic weather conditions, that is to say, controlling for time of the year, suppose it's an unusually warm and unusually cold or icy day, um, does that predict people's car sales um, or purchases? 
and particular also the returns of those cards. Now, um, the, the buying patterns are very much consistent with production bias. People buy more convertibles on good weather days and more um, four wheel drives on bad weather days. And then um, uh, in particular, and again, that evidence by itself is not necessarily production bias. It could just be it's a good weather day and you kind of always wanted to buy a really nice car and therefore you just do it on the good weather day. But people are also more likely to return their convertible and their, um, uh, if they bought it in the good, good weather day and they're more likely to return their four wheel drive if they bought it on a bad weather day. And that's very much consistent with evidence of production bias. On a good weather day, you think, you know, your convertible is going to be amazing forever. You're going to be love driving. And even if it's going to be raining, it's going to be amazing. But of course, if it's raining, a convertible is really not like a, a car that you want to have, or it's really cold outside. That's really not a great car to have. Similarly, um, if you have a four wheel drive and it's really warm and nice outside, you'd probably much rather have like a, a lighter car and, and, and or potentially even like a convertible. Now, one important question here is now in any of the, the, of the behavioral biases that we discussed is how does the market react to such behavior? So one tricky part here is that you want to be kind of careful. So, so on the one hand, you might sort of say, well, let's exploit this kinds of behavior. And I think that's right. You might sort of get people to purchase stuff that they don't necessarily um, uh, want. And surely that's happening in some cases. But to the extent that people can just return these items, that's actually not necessarily a great idea. And particularly if, if, you're, if you're a car, sales, car salesperson and you sell people stuff and then they just come back and you have to deal with them and they're unhappy. And maybe then at the end of the day, you just return the car and actually don't buy anything eventually uh, because they're unhappy. That's really not great um, for you. Plus it wastes a lot of time and effort. On the other hand, uh, you know, sometimes people might just not return things and they might just sort of get stuck with their car and, and, and just leave it at that. And then it might be a good idea to, to exploit this behavior, in particular sort of like on, on good weather day, you might want to try to sell people convertibles. Another thing you could potentially exploit um, is, is essentially people just have higher willingness to pay. Suppose somebody really, really wants to buy a convertible anyway, regardless of the weather. But on a good weather day, their willingness to pay might be higher. And so you might be able to sell them additional stuff or you might be able to, to sell them maybe a nicer version of the car, which probably they're not going to return because, you know, once they have it, they're just going to keep it. And so you might want to um, uh, 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 you know, uh, exploit that if you're um, a company. You might also, um, uh, or there might also be some agency issues within the um, uh, the, the, the car, car um, uh, sales shop, which is like if the salesperson really wants to um, uh, sell things and is incentivized to sell things, and that's regardless of the returns, then you might get into situations where on like sunny days, lots of convertibles are being sold, but they're all being returned. So if you are a company, you kind of want to set the incentives right. That like the car salesman gets only rewarded for stuff that's not um, returned because it precisely gets you like things that will not make you happy or profitable in the long run. Now there's a, another. Um, uh, so as a customer now, how might you take advantage of production bias? Well, and in, in some ways, there's an article or, uh, here that you can look at uh, that argues that winter is the best time to buy a convertible. And so the reason is, of course, is convertibles are, are often cheaper in, in, in winter in part because, you know, the car sales dealer might have like um, storage costs the like. So the convertibles is actually cheaper or, you know, just because people are taking advantage of in the summer um, when they really want convertibles. Now you might sell, say, well, let's just buy a convertible in the winter. And I think that's in principle, um, right? If you have like the time to wait until the summer or like have a long time horizon. Now you want to be a little bit careful with exploiting um, these market conditions um, uh, as a neoclassical uh, agent, uh, which was manifested by uh, some of my colleagues who um, shall be named who wanted to buy a convertible uh, sometime in the summer. They were really excited about the convertible, but then they should have realized that, well, winter is actually the time to, to buy a convertible because it's going to be cheaper. So then they decided, well, let's just wait until the winter and then buy the convertible um, then. Um, of course, what then unfortunately happened, or maybe fortunately, uh, depends on the perspective, once winter arrived, they actually didn't want a convertible anymore. 
because you know driving a winter uh, a convertible in the winter is really not a lot of fun so projection bias perhaps um, also kicked in with my colleagues where they then perhaps should have just bought the convertible um, and then predicted that in the summer they really wanted it but instead they didn't buy it because uh, in winter who wants a convertible um, in the winter so uh, when exploiting behavioral biases from others you want to be careful that uh, you might not be affected or that you may be affected by it um, yourself let me give you one last example, which is this um, example by Van Bogen and Lowenstein, um, which is about thirst. Um, here, um, visitors are asked before or after a vigorous cardiovascular workout, so people are going to the gym, to complete a short survey. And the survey was as follows. Imagine that um, three vacationers in Colorado this past August embarked on a short six-mile hike. As the day wore on, they realized that they were complete, uh, they were hopelessly lost, Worse, because they had packed lightly for a short hike, they had not carried much in the way of food or water. And what people were asked then about, and so they were essentially given this um, uh, this, this, this story, and then um, in the space below, please, uh, uh, they were asked in the, uh, to do the following, in the space below, please take the perspective of one of the three hikers and describe your situation, how you got into it, how you feel now, both physically and mentally, and what you, what you are um, hoping will happen. And now, um, what happens or what the evidence of Van Loven and Lowenstein says is that thirsty subjects have way more empathy for others' thirst. So um, when you look at different outcomes uh, before and after um, exercising, remember after exercising is when people were thirsty. Uh, thirst, it, thirst was mentioned um, uh, uh, before hunger in the essay for how thirsty people much more. Thirst was unpleasant for hikers was mentioned much more. Hikers would regret not packing water. Thirst more unpleasant for the self. Oneself would regret more uh, uh, not packing water. So all of these items that are sort of like um, thirst related, people when they were uh, thirsty after exercising were way more um, um, uh, focused on than than not. So it is as if like people are production biased in the sense like people um, understand much more that the condition of thirst is really bad um, when they're thirsty compared when they are not. Okay, so let me take stock here what, what we discussed. So we, I showed you some evidence of projection bias for many short run changes in preferences. Uh, uh, and so sort of, uh, at least for some of them, there's hunger, thirst, pain, sleep, weather, addiction. Um, there's other evidence as well as arousal, um, anger, sadness, and so on. When people are in certain states, they have trouble to predict their preferences when they're not in that state. Now, one key question that I don't have a great answer for you is why do people not learn? People have lots, have had lots of experience with a lot of these changes, in particular when you think about like sleep or hunger or the like, uh, but even for addiction, when people just have smoked a cigarette versus not, that happens all the time. So they really should have learned uh, over time to predict their preferences. Um, so the misprediction is really not due to a lack of opportunity to learn, yet people really seem to believe all the time that this time is different over and over um, again. So I think that's just a very uh, deep cognitive bias in some ways, in the sense that when people are affected by certain visceral or other um, aspects that affect their preferences, it's, it's really hard to imagine how it might feel um, when that um, visceral influence um, uh, uh, is not at play anymore in the future. Um, in addition to people underestimating um, uh, short-run changes in preferences, people also underestimate adaptation to long-run change. So Dan Gilbert, if you're interested, has a, um, a very nice work on a book, uh, including a book called Stumbling on Happiness, and he gives many examples of the underestimation of adaptation, which, which they uh, call immune neglect. And so, um, and the question here is how does a positive or, or so, so one example is how does a positive or negative tenure decision uh, affect well-being? And so they ask, uh, asking current assistant professors at, U, at the University of Texas to forecast. And then they ask like as well, former University of Texas assistant professors to recall. And you know, as a current uh, assistant professor like myself, if you sort of forecast, if, if there's a negative tenure decision, you know, life will be terrible and like, how will we ever um, uh, gonna live after, after uh, being denied uh, a tenure? Um, uh, um, and so when you then look at what's actually happening, 
well, people seem to be, um, professors seem to be um, relatively accurate in predicting the immediate impact of the tenure decision, but they overestimated the long run impact. That is to say, um, in fact, immediately after being denied tenure, people are maybe, you know, arguably or understandably disappointed and unhappy. But over time, the long run effect is much less severe. People seem to adjust to their circumstances. In the medium and long run, people's, people are uh, uh, almost as, ha as happy as, if not uh, as happy as if they are, uh, had gotten tenure. So there's actually not much of a long run effect. Yet people seem to mispredict the effect. They really seem to think like, in the short run, the effect will be really bad, and that bad effect will be um, last will last forever. So people seem to essentially sort of understand there's a psychological immune system to um, uh, bad events. People recover from negative shocks um, quite well over time, but people seem to mispredict um, this recovery, which, which again is what's called um, immune neglect. There's similar misprediction for other life uh, events, such as paraplegia uh, or, or lottery wins. So like for very negative and positive events, people seem to misunderstand that like, again, in the short run, there's usually a pretty large decrease or increase in people's um, happiness and life satisfaction, but people tend to recover from that quite well over time. But in their prediction, people seem to mispredict um, that adjustment, people seem to think that these bad, uh, uh, the, the bad effects on happiness or bad or good effects on happiness uh, would persist um, forever. Let me now show you a simple model of projection bias by Lewinstein et al. Um, that formalizes some of the intuitions that we discussed so far. Um, so suppose true utility of time t depends on both consumption ct at time t and the state st at time t, so it's u of ct st. The state could be anything that affects utility from consumption, from ranging from the level of hunger or addiction, whether somebody had just smoked versus not, or whether somebody has just gotten some PUP um, uh, dose or not, or past consumption, um, et cetera, whether somebody is tired, and so on. Now the prediction at time t of future utility uh, 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 at time tau larger than t from consuming c tau and state s tau is u hat of c tau s tau, and that equals one minus alpha times u of c, c tau s tau plus alpha times u of c tau s t. Now, what is this expression? Well, if you look at the first part, u of c tau s tau, that is the correct future utility at time tau from consuming c tau and state tau. So if alpha was zero, then this term here would go away. This term is just one. So that is essentially a correct prediction. Um, uh, so there's no production bias. The person has rational expectation about their future utility um, at uh, time tau. Uh, of utility C tau and in state S tau. Now, if alpha is not zero, then there's this additional term here. So this is the weighted average of alpha um, uh, weight for this other term, here, which we're gonna talk about in a second, and one minus alpha of the correct utility um, uh, uh, of consuming C tau in state S tau. Now, what is this other term here? Well, um, the person gets C tau correctly, so the consumption is right, but the state is wrong. And what state is the person using to predict their future utility? Well, it's using ST, the current state. So the person is essentially using the current state to some degree to predict their future utility instead of the future state S tau. Now, notice that if ST and S tau is the same, then there's no problem here. There's going to be no misprediction. So it better be the case that the states S T and S tau are different. For example, a hungry person um, would mispredict the utility from not being hungry. So the utility from not being hungry would be this part. And the person is hungry right now at, at time t if S T equals hungry. The person would predict the future utility even when they're not hungry, thinking that they will always be hungry um, in the future. So alpha um, between zero and one is the degree of um, production bias. Um, so just to, to give you more detail, the person predicts how she'd feel about consuming C tau in the future 
partially at least by how she'd feel about consuming it now. That's what the parameter alpha is measuring. Alpha between zero and one, it could be zero, it could be one, is the degree of protection bias. So alpha equals zero is correct understanding of future utility. That's essentially no protection bias, that's rational expectations. Alpha equals one is full protection bias. That's a person who thinks essentially their future state um, would always be their current state, which of course is not necessarily true. So now the person will optimize according to her perceived future preferences, um, u hat of c tau s tau. And I'm going to assume for now as an exponential discounter, that's of course, um, you can relax that uh, easily. And in fact, in some of the problem sets from previous years and from this year, um, that will be in fact um, relaxed. Now let me give you a very simple example with hunger. Again, um, the problem set um, uh, uh, this year and past problem sets uh, give you quite a few other additional examples that you can study. So suppose there are two states. Um, the, the state is either hungry or not hungry, H or N. And the consumption CT is over burgers and money. So U of CT, uh, where CT is the number of um, um, uh, burgers and money that the person has uh, uh, um, in state H is five times the number of burgers um, that the person eats plus the remaining money that's left that's spent on other things. Um, the utility of CTN when the person is not hungry is um, one times the number of burgers um, plus the money that's left. Now, um, what does that imply? What it implies is that she's willing to pay five dollars for a burger when hungry and one dollar when full. How do, we do, how do we know that? Well, we know that because um, uh, uh, in the first case, when the person is hungry, uh, each um, burger gives five utils and each dollar gives one util. So the exchange rate between burgers and utils is five. So the person is willing to pay $5 per burger. In the second case, the exchange rate between burgers, utility from burgers and utility from dollars is one. So the person is willing to pay $1 for a burger. Now suppose alpha is three quarters. Again, remember alpha is the degree of protection bias. I'm gonna go back to you. Alpha is this parameter here. Alpha is the degree of protection bias. So the degree of misprediction. So suppose in our example here, alpha equals um, um, three quarters and the person is not hungry right now. What is her willingness to pay for a burger tonight when she'll be hungry? So if the person is not hungry right now, her correct utility um, or willingness to pay for a burger is $1. We just established that already, she's full. And uh, the correct utility for willingness to pay for a burger tonight when she'll be hungry is $5. Now her production bias is three quarters. So essentially um, uh, she puts three quarters of uh, a weight on her um, current state and one quarter on the uh, full state. Well, three quarters times one plus one quarters times five, or like going essentially three quarters between a difference of four is essentially um, uh, 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 three. So the person essentially will think that um, their um, uh, future willingness to pay is uh, $2 um, for a burger um, tonight. Or put differently, if she thinks she um, only wants like, um, uh, her willingness to pay will only be $2 um, for a burger tonight. If she orders for a burger tonight and the burger costs like three or $4, she will not be um, willing um, to do that. Now, um, just to be very clear, so like um, the person only uh, essentially, if, if alpha equals three quarters, uh, the person only incorporates one quarter of the preference change from being full versus hungry in the future. So that is to say, um, there's a difference between a four dollars um, between one dollar and five dollars. She only takes into account one fourth of that four dollars, which is one dollars. So willingness to pay as one plus one equals two. You can also write this down here uh, in sort of using the formula from the uh, from the uh, equation from before, which essentially is three quarters, which is the uh, again alpha times the utility. Um, uh, 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 using the current state and one quarter using the current, uh, the correct utility, um, uh, uh, which is the future state. Once you sort of calculate that, um, she will be willing to pay mo at most $2 for a burger. So potentially she's making a mistake. Um, now, and, and so again, in, in, in the, um, uh, in the problem set, you'll have more examples and questions uh, uh, that, that allows you to practice with this little model. Now, why should you care about projection bias? I showed you pretty good evidence of projection bias in many settings in the sense of saying like, uh, you know, uh, 
we think protection bias really exists and we think protection bias might be quite important. So it might be uh, uh, relevant in explaining people's behavior in those settings. Now, the consequences in those settings is relatively unimportant. For example, in car purchases, if rich people buy like convertibles and then sort of return their convertibles, um, you know, the loss from that is not particularly large. Maybe there's some like redistribution across people. Similarly, the catalog orders, people might purchase too many things and return them. Really, um, the consequences are not that large and the actions are often reversible. So why should we then care about protection bias? Well, there's at least two really important applications that I'm going to talk about for a little bit um, that really could matter quite a lot. One is addiction, which is people mispredict their utility from becoming addicted in the future. Um, second is depression and hope. When people are depressed, they might mispredict how they feel when they're not depressed anymore. Um, there's also some some might argue that sort of marriage and relationships are um, uh, quite important. The projection bias might be quite important, particularly when people have fights. They might want to get divorced very quickly. They might sort of do rash things about getting married really quickly or try to get divorced very quickly. And in fact, there are some laws that often prevent that. People need to actually have some cool down period for like a few days where they have to sort of like, um, um, if one wants to like get married, for example, you have to get a license and it takes a few days and only then you can get married. Perhaps or the same is true for our divorce, at least in some places, perhaps that's um, because um, uh, uh, people suffer from protection bias sometimes and when they're really mad at somebody or something really bad happens between them or something really great happened between them, they might not be able to predict that their preferences and their views towards the other person might change um, uh, over time. But let me tell you now a little bit about addiction and um, uh, depression and hope. So first, addiction, and that's the main application we're going to discuss. So protection bias might be important for people's initiation when people are um, starting to take um, uh, drugs. So here, let's define the relevant state as the person's level of addiction. So how much has the person uh, consumed, say, of cigarettes in the last uh, month or year? In an unaddicted state, cigarettes are really not that hard to resist, right? If somebody has never smoked before, cigarettes are really not that attractive. Same is true also for alcohol, for example. In an unaddicted, so in an addicted state, however, it's very hard to resist cigarettes. So if you have smoked a lot recently, you really, really would like to smoke on any given day. Now, the unaddicted person might sort of think that experimenting with cigarettes is fun, but does not want to get addicted for the rest of her life, right? It's sort of fun to do it for a while, but really then you want to stop because being addicted for the rest of your life is really bad. You might get really bad health, con health consequences, um, for instance. And that might give you some false, um, if, if you sort of um, have projection bias, you might have some false sense of control. If you project your current non-addictive preferences into the future, you might think that you can stop smoking or taking drugs if necessary. And so then the person might try cigarettes, get addicted and consume much of her life. Perhaps she wouldn't do so if she knew she couldn't quit, right? That's essentially to say, if you're not addicted right now, you might predict that it's gonna be always easy to stop smoking. And, and in fact, uh, right now it is really uh, easy to uh, stop smoking or resisting, um, but the person might um, uh, uh, mispredict that this will always uh, be the case in the future, even once she is addicted um, and once she has smoked a lot, um, because for the person, for the non-addicted person, it's really hard to imagine that it might be even hard to resist in the future. In addition, um, the quitting and, re re quitting and restarting cycles are very common when it comes to addiction. So addicts often express a desire to stop using substances permanently, but are unable to follow through. That's not surprising, and we kind of like uh, thought about this before, um, and quasi-hyperbolic discounting can essentially predict that um, um, as well. Um, Short-term abstention, in addition, is common, while long-term uh, long abstention is rare. So in 2000, for example, 41% of smokers stopped for at least one day um, trying to quit, and, uh, but only 4.7% um, successfully abstained for more than three months. That doesn't really seem like quasi-hyperbolic discounting. So you wouldn't go through like a pointless short-term pain um, if you're, and then not follow through if you're quasi-hyperbolic discounting. The reason being, if you're in particular, that, that you know the withdrawal symptoms tend to be on average strongest at the start of a quit attempt. So a hyperbolic discounter would not sort of go over this really difficult pain uh, in, in the short run. 
um, um, uh, if you don't follow through because it's essentially short run um, pain. Now, um, and then three, uh, recidivism rates, especially high when addicts are exposed to uh, uh, occasional cues related to past consumption. So treatment programs, in fact, advise recovering addicts to move to new locations and to avoid places when previous consumption to, uh, where previous consumption took place. So let's sort of go through these um, um, one by one and try to see whether we, in particular two and three, whether we can explain those using um, projection bias. So now let's define the state as the strength of cravings at the moment and suppose this varies randomly or with exposure to cues. How do you explain the starting um, a quit attempt? Well, suppose an addict is currently consuming regularly. She experiences periods of low cravings when it's easy to resist. That's like when the person has just smoked, uh, cravings are low and it's easy to resist. So then the person might think, well, it'll, it'll always be easy to resist. So she thinks she, it's worth um, trying to quit and starts the quitting attempt. Now, how do we explain then well, how people uh, abandon the quit attempt? Well, suppose the addict is currently on a quit attempt. Something triggers um, strong cravings, which might just be over time you get the cravings, or maybe the person might just um, uh, be exposed to some cues. So then the person feels it's really hard to resist the drugs. And in particular, she thinks drugs will always be hard to resist so she, because you know currently she's craving a lot and you can't even imagine that it might be um, uh, that, that, that the craving might stop over time. So she thinks the quit attempt is impossible to carry you through and so she abandons it. So that way production bias can both explain why the person starts the quit attempt but also why the person does not follow through. Um, now, Oh, sorry, give me, give me a second. And then um, now, how do we think about the recidivism? Well, here, um, um, you know, there's not necessarily um, uh, protection bias needed, but here, you know, people might miss underestimate um, um, how important the cues are in affecting people's um, uh, uh, utility. So if it's the case that an addict, for example, when the addict walks by like a liquor store or when the addict is uh, talking to friends whom they have been taking drugs in the past uh, and so on, um, that might really uh, increase people's marginal utility of using drugs. So they might get really, really strong cravings and it might be really, really hard for them to resist. Now, if you know that as an addict um, who, who, who is recovering, uh, who's not taking any drugs currently, you should at all costs avoid these cues because you know um, uh, you kind of want to make sure that you're not exposed to them. And, but if you have protection bias, you might underestimate the importance of those cues in affecting um, um, uh, your utility or your, your, your cravings. And so you might sort of like walk into a bar thinking like, well, I haven't really been smoking or drinking for a long time, so I'm surely will be able to resist. But of course, then once you're exposed to these cues, um, you will not be able to do so. And that misprediction might really then cause um, recidivism. So again, that's, so that in that sense, protection bias is also consistent um, with that kind of recidivism uh, due to cues. Now, um, uh, let me so talk very briefly only about um, um, depression uh, and, and the reason being that we're going to talk about mental health in a future lecture. So depressed individuals have the tendency to project their depressed feelings not only to the future, but also um, to the past. And so um, uh, in particular, um, uh, you know, the, the depressed tend to think about um, uh, you know, depression is the, the inability to construct a future. And in particular, when someone is depressed, the past and future are absorbed entirely by the present, and people can neither remember feeling better nor imagine that they will feel better um, in the future. So that's to say, if the person is really feeling terrible right now, um, they also think, you know, they always have been feeling terrible in the past, and they also think that they will always feel terrible in the future. So then, you know, life might feel particularly hopeful if there's no scope for future improvements. And if you think your life was always that bad, um, there's really, um, uh, uh, in some cases, people might think there's really not much of a reason um, to live. And that's, of course, an extremely dangerous and um, um, uh, uh, difficult or, or, or consequential, potentially, misprediction. Because of course, depressed people can get better through therapy and through 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 drugs and so on, um, um, uh, and often there's also remission over time. Um, but if people mispredict that, um, they might, for instance, uh, never seek treatment because they think, "Why would I ever seek treatment if I'm always feeling terrible um, for the rest of my life um, anyway?" We're going to get back to that a little bit when talking about mental health. Now. Um, 
One thing that we have not really talked about is how to think about these different biases. In particular, what's the difference between projection bias and naive quasi-hyperbolic discounting? So both naivete and quasi-hyperbolic discounting and projection bias entail a misprediction. So as an example, take a smoker who wants to quit. Uh, the naive quasi-hyperbolic discounter overestimates their future patients. So that person will sign up for a, a commitment contract to stop smoking and might fail due to the overestimation of usefulness of commitment devices, right? That person thinks, you know, um, uh, uh, that commitments, uh, that person understands that she has some, suppose that's a partially naive person, which we need, otherwise the person would never sign up for a commitment contract. Suppose the person is partially naive, the person will sign up for that commitment contract thinking that's going to help them stop smoking, uh, but the person is going to underestimate how bad their self-control problems are. So then the person might fail because they think the commitment device is really, really helpful, but in fact, it's not um, strong enough. Now, um, for projection bias, the person might underestimate the influence of altered future states. So the person might also sign up for a commitment contract to stop smoking and then might fail due to, the, due to the underestimation of the changes in future cravings. That is to say, if you are currently not craving, you might sign up for a commitment contract that would help you um, to continue not using drugs. And you might um, underestimate, however, how bad the cravings will be in the future once you see certain cues or the like. So again, you might choose a commitment contract that is not strong enough because you mispredict your future preferences. In this case, not because it's in the future, not because you mispredict your beta, like in case number one, but rather because you mispredict how uh, um, strongly future um, uh, states will affect your preferences. You can also think about another example, anesthesia during childbirth. You can um, uh, get similar sort of um, um, patterns, both um, naive quasi-hyperbolic discounting and projection bias might be able to explain uh, people's choices there. In particular, both of them would potentially um, uh, predict preference reversals. Now, how can we tell now projection bias and naivete um, regarding beta um, uh, apart? Well, the key part here is that projection bias is a state-dependent misprediction. So people are more likely to predict future temptation to overeat when hungry. They're more likely to predict smoking when you haven't had a cigarette for a while. So when people are, when the state in the future is different from the current state, people might mispredict um, their preferences. So now, and, and um, uh, uh, present bias, in fact, it, it has nothing to do with the state. It's essentially just about like the future versus um, the present. So now, um, what do we need? What kind of variation do we need to disentangle uh, uh, the two explanations? Well, you need variation in timing and in particular variation in states. So present bias would say, um, it doesn't really matter what state you're in. It doesn't matter whether you're hungry or not right now. There's always going to be a misprediction between the present and the future. And um, production bias would very much say the states are a matter. It's a state-dependent misprediction. Okay, so if you wanted to look at like people's um, uh, predictions for the future, present bias or naivete regarding present bias would say it doesn't matter whether you have smoked or whether you're hungry right now for your prediction for the future. Projection bias would say it does matter um, quite a bit. But then there's a tricky question is when should you in fact offer people commitment devices? Well, you should probably offer people commitment devices if you want them to choose correct predict, uh, uh, correct, um, uh, uh, if, you may, if you want people to make correct choices, you probably want to um, uh, offer people commitment devices at times when they're in fact in the same state. So when somebody already has cravings, you want to offer them a commitment device because that person really understands how it will feel in the future. If instead you offer somebody a commitment device when they don't have cravings, they might choose that commitment device, which I guess is good, but then they might fail because they mispredict um, how strong of a commitment device they might need in the future. So let me then briefly summarize. So, so what did we talk about? So we talked about state-dependent preferences. So preferences vary systematically with the underlying states, for example, um, hunger. Food is tastier when you're hungry. Uh, going on dates is um, uh, uh, less enjoyable while being sick. Classes are best when we're rested. Um, now, 
people know that people's preferences are there in their states, they understand that. If you ask like 100 people about like, are your preferences different when you're hungry versus not, most people would probably say, you know, they want different types of kinds of food and the like, and they may behave differently when they're hungry. Um, however, there are um, uh, biases in state-dependent decision-making. In particular, both intuition and psychology suggest that we fail to appreciate the extent to which our preferences change with the underlying states. Protection bias is a specific psychological error of this type. People overestimate the extent to which future tastes resemble their current tastes, and they underestimate the influence that the state has on their utility. And that can lead to a systematic misprediction. Uh, I showed you quite a few applications. In particular, addiction and depression might be the most um, consequential applications of projection bias. Now, there's one more bias um, uh, uh, that I told you I'm going to talk about very briefly. Again, that's going to be discussed in detail in recitation, which is called attribution bias. Now, uh, attribution bias in some sense is very similar, but it's backward looking. So while projection bias is the misprediction of the influence of future states. So when you think about like the future, are you going to be, uh, uh, how are you going to enjoy a meal depending on you're hungry versus not, or burgers versus salad? Um, how is your future preferences shaped by uh, future states? Attribution bias is instead backward looking. It's the misprediction of the influence of past states. Um, so that's to say, and let me sort of define that um, briefly. Uh, when judging the value of a good, people are overly influenced by the state in which they previously um, consumed it. Now, let me give you some examples, and again, then you'll talk about this more in recitation. Um, people are more likely to return to a restaurant when first tried when hungry. So if you go to a restaurant when you're really, really hungry, you think the food is like amazing. Um, but in fact, it might just be that you're really, really hungry. So when you then come back to the restaurant, you might be surprised that in fact, it's not that great. Um, people are also more likely to negatively uh, rate a movie um, uh, when they've seen it while tired. Well, why is that? Because the experience is just not that great. And then you sort of think the movie is really not that great, but really it's just you were tired. People are also less likely to recommend a zoo to a friend if it rained during the last visit. Well, it's just the experience of that zoo is not that great. Of course, and some days it rains and some days it doesn't. So you're not gonna tell usually your friends only go there when it's sunny. People are saying like this zoo is just not that much fun. And perhaps more um, uh, relevant for you, people are more likely to recommend, or maybe more likely to recommend a class um, that they took um, uh, while well rested. So I was, um, uh, a few years ago, I was teaching um, 1413 at, at 9 a.m. and I got lots of complaints from students uh, about the class being way too early. And I was telling them, uh, uh, or trying to tell them that, you know, the class is really uh, lots of fun. Uh, you may, uh, may or may not be able to appreciate that if you're really um, uh, tired. So attribution bias might sort of make you think that, um, uh, might attribute um, some negative or positive experience um, to the actual underlying quality of the um, uh, issue or the, the, the good that's being offered, as opposed to as you should to the underlying state. Again, you're going to talk more about this in recitation. Now, what's next? Uh, remember, there's no class on Monday, um, April 20. Um, on Wednesday, April 22, we're going to talk about gender discrimination and identity. Please um, read Heather Sarson's paper on section one, adjust the introduction. Uh, thank you um, very much.